welcome everybody. Um, should I stay here? Does this, does this amplify my voice at all, or should I just walk around? You're good. Um, so, uh, um, this, uh, I'm very pleased to, uh, to introduce Josh Miller, tell you a little bit about him, but first I wanted to say this occasion and what made it possible. So this, uh, this, um, this uh, presentation was made possible by the Student, the Student Activities Council and the Hawaii Island Philosophy Club organized this. And thanks so much to Celia for doing a whole lot. Celia Barlow Jones uh, of philosophy did a whole lot of organization to make all this possible. And uh, so, um, uh, uh, several of us in the uh, at UH Hilo are trying to reach out to justice involved students in a variety of ways. And uh, um, as we've been trying to do this, I, um, got, I, I had a chance to spend a good deal of time with my old friend from graduate school, Josh Miller, over the break. I knew that he'd been doing this work for over a decade now, right? right uh, Seven years. Seven years, yeah. and he um, and um, he inspired me to get a move on and try to do more of this and do it more quickly. So we're we invited him here for his uh, expertise and his logistical advice, but also for uh, to give us a little bit of inspiration about what's possible when we turn prisons into colleges or do whatever we can to do that. So uh, Josh is. Uh, currently the Director of Education at Georgetown University's Criminal Justice Initiative. Prisons and Justice. Prisons and Justice uh, Initiative, which means that he uh, is responsible for administering uh, a pretty wide-scale uh, um, program to bring a, a large number of D.C. area Maryland uh, students into um, credit-bearing college classes. This is the third different university we've organized this sort of program at. Uh, the first was Loyola University of Maryland, and then uh, Baltimore, University of Baltimore. And Georgetown scooped them up just this year to, uh, to run uh, this larger program. And so he's, he's a guy with a lot of expertise on this, but also with uh, a lot of heart behind what he's doing. I've known his work for about 16 years now, I guess it's been. He's, been, uh, he's long been uh, a passionate advocate for building democratic institutions and community engagement in lots of different ways. That is the, um, the, um, what he has made his mark in, in the philosophical world. Uh, what he's doing is, in some ways, uh, just a sideline. He's getting uh, involved more and more in this, but he's also uh, um, a brilliant philosopher who's doing very important work on those issues, too. So I, I imagine he's going to bring a little bit of those two things together. But uh, I'm eager to hear what he has to say on, on whatever he has to say. <laughs> Thank you, Josh, for coming. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and thank you to the Hawaii Island uh, Philosophy Club for bringing me. Um, as Chris said, uh, I started working in the fall of uh, 2017 at Georgetown University, trying to get Georgetown uh, involved in criminal justice education on a large scale. Um, the background here is that Georgetown, like many universities in the United States, uh, has a history with slavery. The Jesuit priests who, uh, who founded the university founded it for the education of white men. And they founded it with the intention of funding that education with plantations in the state of Maryland. Um, and in the 1820s, um, slavery and plantation work in Maryland uh, was no longer profitable. And Georgetown's uh, Jesuit priests uh, sold their slaves, 272 slaves, uh, to pay off their, the debts of the university. The university only exists because of slavery and we're trying to make reparations. Uh, and so they, they hired me to, as a part of that process. Uh, so that's the, back, the background. Let me tell you what we've been doing. Um, we've created, a, right now, a, a program in the DC jail, which is a, a short-term institution uh, that offers college courses to 
an incarcerated student. Um, and that's usually what I will call them in this talk is student. To uh, distinguish incarcerated campus students. Um, but I'm, I'm going to talk about incarcerated students. I'm going to talk about prisoners sometimes. I won't usually use words like inmates. So here's a question. Um, should we turn prisons into colleges? Uh, that's what brought you here. Um, I'll, I'm going to answer the question quickly, because uh, I think this is going to be obvious from my work. Yes. Uh, any questions? <laughs> this was easy. No. Uh, here's a question. Why? Why should we turn prisons into colleges? Don't we have enough problems uh, with colleges on, on the outside? I think that uh, there are a bunch of reasons to consider, uh, and they have varying uh, value in my assessment of the question. So first, as I say, education reduces recidivism. Uh, recidivism is a weird um, concept. It's the, the way in which uh, someone who's justice involved, someone who returns home from prison, might find themselves returning to prison once again. Sometimes this can be for a technical parole violation, sometimes because they re-offend, um, sometimes uh, for other reasons. The key here is that however we measure it, uh, all the studies seem to suggest that education makes us safer and it prevents prisoners from returning. Um, and I think we have to talk about both sides of that. There's less crime and less punishment when we educate prisoners. Wow. Well, I think that mass incarceration is the domestic civil rights and human rights crisis of our time. I'm going to say a lot more about this, but um, many people are familiar with Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, um, and there are, uh, uh, have been a host of books and articles arguing that mass incarceration is at the heart of policing problems in the United States is at the heart of um, basically of white supremacy in the United States. And we can't take those things seriously without at the same time confronting what we are doing in America's prisons and jails. Um, I also think that crime is serious. Crime is not very high right now, and I'll show you some charts to prove that. But uh, crime, is, crime is a problem. Uh, it's, it's what philosophers like to call a wicked problem. Um, there aren't easy solutions. Most of the solutions involve making trade-offs and sacrifices, not just you know, financial, but in our most, uh, our most precious values. Um, and it's hard to solve these problems, and I think that uh, a university like the University of Hawaii uh, is in a very good position um, to bring your faculty, your researchers, your teachers, um, to bear on this wicked problem, thinking it through and confronting it um, too often. So I, oh, I have a, an ally here in sociology. Too often, criminal justice, uh, criminal punishment is reserved for law schools, sociology, um, criminal justice programs, and philosophers, art historians, um, English professors, biologists are not thinking about it. Um, this is a problem that the entirety of the university needs to bring its uh, capacities to bear on. And teaching inside of prisons is one way uh, to do that, to, to get started thinking about it. Um, ultimately, though, I think prison education can and should inform campus education. I think that there are things you can learn in a prison classroom that you should bring to bear when you're teaching or learning um, outside of prisons. Uh, so I'll say a bunch more about that in a little bit. All right, so recidivism. Uh, RAND is a, a, a research group that uh, does meta studies. They study studies. They try to gather them all together and figure out what uh, the weight of evidence supports. Uh, they put out in 2015 a study showing that um, prison education at the higher education level, university and college education, reduces recidivism by 43%. That's 43% fewer reincarcerations. That's some significantly larger number of fewer robberies, sexual assaults, um, uh, drug abuse, etc. That's desirable. We should be excited about that. I tout that number wherever I go. Um, 
even if you don't like the crimes that people can, uh, have committed, if you want to see fewer of them, you should educate prisoners. Uh, the study shows that a lot of this is mediated by work. As you probably know, there's a significant stigma attached to a criminal record. And uh, many employers will do a criminal background check. Merely having uh, a criminal background or time in prison uh, can make you unemployable in many states. Um, certainly much harder to be employed. A college education, and a certainly a college degree, acts as a kind of counter signal. It says, yeah, I have this history, but I'm not that person anymore. Give me another chance. Uh, there are, however, uh, and I think the Rand study doesn't uh, deal enough with this, there are very large potential selection effects. It could be the case that what we are doing when we offer college education in prison is we're finding the best and the brightest, the talented tenth, and we are um, pulling them out. We're giving them an opportunity to prove themselves, but it, we're not doing anything about the larger problem. Um, it could be the case, especially because there haven't been colleges operating in uh, prisons and jails for the last 24 years. Um, in large numbers, it could be the case that we're just finding a, a large cohort or a large group of people um, who need and want a college education, but that there just isn't. This isn't scalable in a certain way. We'll talk about that. So, here we go. Uh, I think, let's see, all right. Yeah, here we go. So, uh, Olympus, it, it's true. I'm not, I'm not selling you anything you don't, need, you don't know. Uh, but it is true that college professors are cheaper than correctional officers. Uh, we uh, are more effective than correctional officers. Philosophers are cheap. Um, the RAND study shows that we can spend $140,000 educating uh, prisoners. And because of the reductions in recidivism, because of how expensive it is, to house someone in a secure facility, um, we can save $870,000. Now, I want to be clear about this. I don't think that this is about um, dollars and cents. I don't think this is merely a matter of making investments that save us money for the future. But if I can save the state money, and that might help them see the value in funding this kind of work, shouldn't I let them know? Uh, so I wanted to share this with you. It's, it's important data. You can find this table in the RAND study, um, which is available online. Um, using Pell Grants, um, the main benefits from a college program is to states where most prisoners are incarcerated, states like Hawaii. Um, but the cost came from the federal government, and that's one of the reasons that uh, Pell Grants were suspended for prisoners. There's a mismatch between who saves the money and who pays for it. And sometimes when that happens, you get in inefficiencies. Uh, nonetheless, I want to say this again. We don't measure the value of a college education merely by the amount of extra income college graduates get, even though that's substantial. Um, and we don't measure college educations generally by the reduction in recidivism. We don't ask ourselves, how often do Georgetown students or Hilo students uh, return to prison, um, although in some cases, we might actually be worried about that. Uh, so these are not the best ways to measure the value of college education in prison. These are not the best ways to answer the question. But I want to start here because I think for some people, this is all the case you need to see. <laughs> so like I said, there are problems with recidivism as a metric. Um, recidivism sometimes, not in the case of the RAND study, but sometimes, uh, is projected at 76%. That means 76% of prisoners in the federal and state systems will return to prison within five years. But recidivism is not reoffense. That does not always mean that prisoners who return are committing another crime. Most often, they're returned to prison for technical parole violations. Because when you're on, on parole, you can be returned to prison for missing a meeting, which you might have to do because you also have to be working or seeking work. And sometimes you have to trade. You have to decide, am I going to make that extra shift or lose my job and go to the parole meeting where, having lost my job, my parole officer will then return me to prison or jail. These kinds of catch-22s are very common for justice-involved individuals. 
and a result, as a result, the recidivism metric as it's normally used is not a good guide. Nonetheless, recidivism rates are still high, probably in the 40% range, 43% is one commonly cited number. Um, so a, a sort of more important problem with thinking about recidivism is that some kinds of crimes have higher recidivism rates than others. Um, and if you're running a program inside of a prison or jail that offers a chance to remake yourself, to change your future, to give you a second chance, um, using recidivism rates can sometimes push those programs away from choosing the, uh, the people with the highest likelihood of reoffending. People really want to cherry pick their participants. And if you cherry pick your participants, you don't have the biggest effects that you could. You don't save us in the ways that uh, you could from the crimes we're most worried about. So that's recidivism. But let's talk about uh, what might have brought you here, which is that increasingly we are coming to realize that prisons in the United States do not work like prisons in the rest of the world. Our crime rates are not high. We are safer in the United States than we have been since the 60s. And yet, we incarcerate 2.2 million people. And as you can see, the rate of incarceration in the United States is higher than in totalitarian countries. It's higher than in Russia. Uh, it is out of whack. Something strange is happening here. We should not be allowing this to continue. It is a human rights crisis. It's a civil rights crisis. Uh, prisons are, are not safe spaces, and we incarcerate way more of our fellow citizens than we ought to do. Um, the problem is vast. And as I said, the problem is not tied to crime. Some people would like to believe that we have a large number of prisoners in the United States because that's what keeps us safe. But all the evidence suggests that we have continued to increase the rate of incarceration even as crime rates have fallen. We made a devil's bargain in the 80s and 90s. We accepted very, very harsh sentencing because we were scared of crime. And crime was high in the 80s and 90s. I don't want to, um, I don't want to deny that. Uh, but when crime fell, sentencing did not. Sentencing has increased. All right, so here's a bunch of charts to prove my claim. I won't make you sit through too much of this. Uh, all of these charts come from the Prison Policy Initiative. And if you're interested in the data, right? I'm a philosopher. I'm not always interested in data, but I think data is helpful sometimes. For thinking about these things, you should check them out. They, they make a very pretty chart. Um, I want to point to a couple of things. Sometimes when you talk about prison policy uh, in the United States, you will hear people talk about the federal government. Um, certainly if you've read The New Jim Crow, she tends to emphasize the federal government and federal policy. Um, the federal government is just not a large portion of the pie. Most of this problem cannot be dealt with at the federal level, because most of this problem is tied to the states. Now, um, because I live in the District of Columbia in Washington, D.C., uh, we have a kind of claim to fame there, which is that if you measure just states, Louisiana is by far the most serious incarcerator. But um, Washington, D.C., which is um, run by African Americans, has a black mayor, a majority black D.C. council, nonetheless is the highest, has the highest rate of incarceration in the nation. Um, twice in the top two-thirds. Uh, so this is something for you to take seriously as well. Um, and unfortunately, it is not the case that most people are incarcerated for nonviolent drug crimes. The drug war has played a major role in this, but the majority of prisoners are incarcerated for violent crimes, crimes that you think are bad. Um, and this is important because uh, when we tell ourselves that we need to end the drug war, legalize marijuana, and that will solve mass incarceration, we are wrong. Right, so I just wanna, I wanna show you that so that you can think about it. Uh, areas of growth are somewhat important. So jails, community, correction centers, 
um, are increasingly incarcerating larger numbers of people and ruining people's lives with entrances and exits in ways that we need to fix. Oh no, this didn't work right. There we go. This worked earlier, so let me just show it to you. There you go. Uh, so you know this now, um, that uh, prisons incarcerate disproportionately uh, African Americans, Latinos, and, and Native Americans. Um, but one of the reasons that we call it the New Jim Crow is because the disproportion massively affects African Americans. Um, even in African American run um, cities and states, it still ends up being the case that for some, well, for reasons that we'll talk about, um, they end up suffering the brunt of mass incarceration. Calling it mass incarceration leaves out the fact that it is racialized in the United States. In Hawaii, of course, um, the native uh, population matters more. Um, there we go. Something's not working right here, but I'll get it fixed. So even though there are 2.2, so it's 2.2 million uh, as of a week ago, we got new numbers, uh, but it's been 2.3 million for a while. So that's what you'll see in a lot of these slides. Um, the BJS, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, just released the first ever uh, um, decrease uh, in the number of people incarcerated in, in our facilities. So even though it does affect prisoners, even more than that, it affects people on probation and parole. Right? Um, so having 4.5 uh, million people on probation and parole deeply affects their lives in ways that we'll talk about more, but those 7 million people are suffering and that's one of the reasons why this issue is so important. Here we go. Last thing that I think I'll, I want you to know is that while women make up 7% of those who are incarcerated in the United States, um, their numbers are growing rapidly. They're growing in an interesting way. Uh, women have historically been, uh, had more lenient sentencing for any particular crime. Um, we are starting to try to achieve parity in this country, but we're doing it the wrong way. We're starting to treat women more like men. Um, and we need to start treating men more like women. More we can say about that as well. When you think about crime and punishment, it's important to start with how you would want someone to deal with a transgression. When someone hurts you, when they transgress an important rule or a norm in our lives, um, think about what you would want to happen. Right? Your neighbor driving recklessly uh, knocks over your mailbox. Um, your friend gets drunk and starts a fight. What is an ideal apology? And what is the ritual by which we restore both the perpetrator and the victim to their original relationship? Um, I think this requires a number of things. Right? So we, we talk about making the victim whole. And what we mean by that is replacing stolen or destroyed possessions, right? healing their injuries, counseling them in response to the trauma that they may experience. But not necessarily, not all crime victims experience serious trauma. And recreating for them a sense of safety, a sense that they can walk alone at night again, that um, they can go home and not risk uh, you know, a burglary or something like that. So this is an, in, I, an ideal apology. You would want to do that. Your neighbor should fix your mailbox if he knocks it over with his car while driving recklessly. Um, but you know, if you've been the victim of a serious crime, of a violent crime, we want to fix you up, prepare you to sort of um, feel safe again in the space in which you were endangered, um, and give you the counseling you may need. But it means things for the perpetrator too. Because remember the goal in an ideal apology is to restore the relational norms, the, the original status quo before 
the perpetration, before the transgression occurred. Right? For in an ideal apology, this almost always means confessing guilt. Yes, I did that, and I'm sorry. Right? It also means acknowledging that what you did was wrong. And in the United States today, we have a lot of crimes that the perpetrators do not see as legitimate. Right? It, what I did was illegal, but was it wrong? Uh, I don't feel that. We want perpetrators to be able to acknowledge the legitimacy of the violated norm. Whatever they did that they shouldn't have done, we want them to be able to see that they shouldn't have done it. And that sometimes means that we need to reconsider the things that we have criminalized when there's not widespread belief that those things are wrong. And in an ideal apology, we want the perpetrator to participate in restitution. Not the state, but the individual who made a mistake who had a transgression. In the United States, our criminal courts prevent the apology ritual, the ideal apology that your friend, when she's late, would go through to sort of restore your relationship. Right? In the United States, uh, conflicts could be opportunities for norm clarification. Was this really wrong, or did we make it illegal, but we shouldn't have? And they should be opportunities for victims and perpetrators to participate in the dispensation of justice. But we don't do that. Right? Everything in modern states, in the United States and elsewhere, steals the conflict from the individuals who have experienced it, from the victim and the perpetrator. Right? Um, and we do that because we believe that procedural fairness and the professionalization of the police, of lawyers, etc., is more important than the victim being made whole or the perpetrator being restored to his or her community. That means the perpetrators can't confess guilt without weakening her case, um, and the victim cannot personally reprove the one who injured her, reprove from the word reprobation. Sometimes you just need to yell and scream at the person who hurt you. We don't let people do that as much as they really ought to be allowed to do. So what is prison for? There are a lot of theories. Um, here are the main theories. Uh, some people argue that prisons are, are for retribution, that criminals just deserve to be treated badly. And I don't think we should ignore that. That's a strong impulse that we have that criminals, that people who hurt us should be deprived of their liberty just because they hurt us and we want to hurt them back. Um, but with 2.3, 2.2 million people incarcerated, there are a lot of people incarcerated um, that we probably are being overly punitive with. And remember that first slide that showed how disproportionately we punish each other. Um, instead, you should be thinking about the other R's on this slide. Right? Rehabilitation. What if we could take a delinquent character, someone who has uh, a drug addiction or a tendency to steal or doesn't respect the uh, possessions or the, the truth, uh, the possessions of others or the truth and lies on forms, and through solitude, through uh, meditation, maybe even through good old fashioned labor, we can make them better. Um, there's a lot to worry about in the concept of rehabilitation as we've inherited it. Uh, but still, it's an, it's an ideal that many people feel ought to be a part of our punishment system. And since the beginning of mass incarceration in the 80s, we have seen our criminal punishment system becoming less and less and less rehabilitative. We just don't have the resources. Everything is spent trying to keep these people safe-ish. Um, and contained. Um, and we deprive ourselves of the best tools like education, reconnecting with family, uh, for that kind of rehabilitation. Now, that word reprove is coming back here because I think reprobation is really important. Some things are wrong. Think about Larry Nasser. Right? Think about the Stanford rapist, Brock Turner. Somebody does something wrong and you let them get away with it. If they, if they have impunity for a long period of time, it hurts us. It hurts us all to see them go unpunished, to see them getting away with it. If there's not official condemnation, 
of the truly terrible acts that people have engaged in. Um, then we've, we've failed to restore the status of the victim. We've failed to do those things that recreate a sense of safety, um, that make her or him feel like what happened to them was wrong and we acknowledge it. But the last thing I think is perhaps the most important, the vast majority, 95%, uh, of prisoners will return to their communities. And we get to decide what that's going to look like. Right now, we largely decide that we want to treat them like second or third class citizens. That when they return to their communities, they should be desperate, they should have trouble finding housing, they should be unemployed. Everyone should look at them and see them as less than us. Um, and that has led to significantly more crime, more criminals, more prisoners, and more second and third class prisoners. I'm sorry, second and third class citizens. So if we took reintegration seriously, I think it would incorporate all of this. Because we've really got to restore the prisoner too. Restore the perpetrator um, to the status ex quo. This is important. Um, often we think of prisons as primarily about prevention. If we didn't threaten people with prison, then they would continue to commit the same transgressions that they had committed before. Um, but philosophers of punishment have largely rejected prevention as a justification for incarceration or punishment. Um, I want to just say a couple of things about this. We can re return to it in the question and answer. But um, uh, we, used to, we, we used to talk about this film, Minority Report. Have you guys seen it? No? Okay. Where uh, officers of the law would punish people that they saw were about to commit crimes. They called it a pre-crime unit. Um, but think about it like this. There are cities in this country where uh, the police department um, has a database that tries to measure the likelihood of somebody becoming justice involved. And if you grew up in a family where your, fam where your mother and father or your brother and sister are justice involved, whether if you're involved in gangs or the drug trade, or your mother is a sex worker, you're, you are very likely to have a higher rate of incarceration. And so cities like uh, Chicago keep a database. And this database can start to monitor someone as soon as they're born and say, hey, this kid is more likely to go to prison than other people. Um, I think there's something creepy about that. Uh, I think. Uh, when you think about incarcerating someone, putting them under increased surveillance when they've committed no crime, when they're very young, when uh, they have all the opportunities in the world, and you sort of, before they've done anything, decide to classify them as a risk, not as a, as a gift, not as a, um, a miracle, but as a risk, uh, you've, you've made a mistake. So that's, that's important, but that's for someone who hasn't committed a crime, right? What if someone has committed a crime? Does it make sense to say, let's assess their likelihood of reoffending, let's assess how much of a danger to society they are going to be, and keep them incarcerated until their risks are reduced? The problem there is that seems to justify massively disp disproportionate punishments based on the likelihood to reoffend. Somebody without a college degree or a high school degree is much more likely to reoffend than someone with it. Would we feel comfortable saying that when I am arrested and incarcerated because I have a PhD, that I should serve a small sentence, but that someone who is a high school dropout should, for the same crime, serve a large sentence? That seems objectionable to us, even though, again, um, or it seems objectionable to me, but uh, I think perhaps to you as well. Uh, even though, again, that is probably an accurate prediction of the likelihood to reoffend, the likelihood to be a danger in the future. It's just not the way we think about justice. All right, so <clears throat> here's what I've been trying to say. We can think about reprobation and reintegration together. We can think about restoring the relationship of mutual respect and equality between offenders and victims, between all members of our society. 
Uh, and when we do that, we get a much better understanding of what punishment can and should be. It's not what it is, but what it could be. We should be asking ourselves how we can make offenders and victims, members of, uh, of our community, in good standing again. And the hard part, I think, for most people is how do we make offenders members of our community again, right? Everybody's sort of, victims are classically innocent, and so often we find ourselves motivated to try to restore them to their status quo and to ex ante, but, um, but sometimes we don't when the victim is uh, already a second-class citizen, uh, already a member of a, a stigmatized group, sometimes we don't see it as so important to restore them either. And part of the way we do that is by not punishing crimes against them. I think that's something to keep in mind. Here's the core of, of the philosophical concept here. Uh, if we are going to hold people responsible at all, if responsibility is a relationship that we can hold each other to, then we need also to engage in other practices with, with them that treat them as responsible agents. Right? You can't just sort of treat someone as irresponsible, as, as uh, not worthy of respect or attention, um, of relation in other ways, and wait until they transgress, not caring all the ways in which they have been a victim in the past, and then say, aha, we've caught you. Throw them in, in jail or prison and treat them despicably for the rest of their lives. I think that holding someone responsible, someone morally responsible for their actions, involves being prepared to accept promises, offer confidences, exchange vows, cooperate on a project, enter a social contract, have a conversation, make love, be friends, or get married. What I mean by that is that when we look at the people who are incarcerated, before they were incarcerated, we largely didn't treat them as those kinds of agents. People with whom we would be willing to get married, to be friends, to have a conversation. And so one reason, again, that we need to be offering college education, high school education, uh, in, in prisons and jails, is because we need to get, we need to restore the relationship that we were supposed to have with the perpetrator that we didn't before. Right? I've been talking about status quo ante. Right? The status quo before the transgression. But for most prisoners, we see that they are disproportionately poor, poorly educated, marginalized from in our society in lots of different ways. And then they commit a crime, they're caught, and we throw them in jail, pretending as if they had been treated up till that moment as fully equal members of the social contract, fully equal um, sort of co-citizens, co-creators of our shared world. And then, oops, you made a mistake. Now we're going to punish you. But in fact, we've been punishing them all along. Um, and so I think one of the things that this concept of reprobation and reintegration makes clear is that often the re is a mistake. These are people who were never properly integrated into our communities in the first place. And if we're going to treat them with the respect that they deserve, we have a lot to make up for, even though they're being punished, usually, for a serious violent crime. Uh, so prison education can and should inform campus education. Uh, I have a couple of things in mind here, but I just want to take a break and show you some pictures. The bottom right is a picture of me um, teaching a course on a lawn in Washington, D.C. in the middle of autumn. This is, at least in the northeast of the United States, the ideal teaching environment. I know, I know you don't have fall leaves here, but uh, this, is, this is the kind of fantasy of college education, right? Uh, an, an autumnal lawn. Everybody's outside. They're reading a difficult text and talking. Um, this, was a, this is a fond memory of mine. But the other two are also fond memories, even though they're in uh, correctional spaces, because these, these guys that I've been working with for seven years now are extremely bright. Um, they're extremely committed, they're interested in the education that they're receiving. And they've taught me a lot about teaching. They've taught me a lot about what education can and should be. Because for the first five years that I did this, the courses that I offered were um, not for credit. So they came to class, they did the reading, they did the homework, and they got nothing out of it other than the pleasure of reading the book, 
writing the papers and meeting with me to talk about it. Um, so I, I mean this as seriously as I can. Uh, you can learn a lot about education from educating incarcerated students. Uh, and you should give it a try. So a long quote from Bell Hooks, but I just want to emphasize one piece. Sometimes, right now in fact, uh, professors act like um, the, the model for teaching is that we know a bunch of things, and if we kind of spew it all at you, uh, you will learn it, and then you can spew it all back at us, right? Um, it's, a, it's a push model of education. In a seminar space, what that often means is that professors act like all-knowing, silent interrogators. Right? We're all reading a text, but I know the right answer. I ask you a series of questions to discern whether you've read it carefully, um, whether you've learned the lessons of previous courses, uh, previous um, texts that we've read together. I, I think that that's just wrong. This is not something I learned from Bell Hooks. This is something I learned from my students inside. But Bell Hooks already knew it, so I thought I would share it with you here. <clears throat> um, good teaching, the right kind of teaching, uh, exposes a little bit the professor, the teacher, um, makes us vulnerable. And education can work better when that happens. When students can ask questions and I don't know the answer, and they, um, uh, their curiosity opens pathways of inquiry that I did not anticipate. Uh, that happens to me all the, all the time inside of prisons and jails. Um, and I think it's an experience that we really need to export from prisons and jails back onto campus. Some campuses have this ideal, I'm sure Hilo is one, um, but other campuses don't. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to share that, that this is something that can happen and should. So, um, I've been talking about why, but let's talk about how. There are, are three big models for uh, teaching inside of prisons and, and jails. Uh, you can do it as I began doing it, with no credit. Uh, both professors and students volunteered. We met together um, just for the pleasure of each other's company and because of a shared commitment to reading difficult texts together, to learning new things together. Um, that can work really well. And one of the reasons it can work so well is because it's cheap. Um, other than the cost of materials, the books, and the, paper, the you know, printing costs for the readings, um, the cost is time. Prisoners in many places don't have as much time as you think they do because they're forced to work. And scene 13, uh, that slavery has not been abolished for uh, incarcerated individuals, people who have been uh, convicted of a felony. Uh, in many places, they have to work, but they are not paid minimum wage. In the state of Maryland, they're paid 95 cents a day for eight hours of work. Um, I don't know what it is in Hawaii. I'd love to learn. You can, you can offer courses inside for credit, and I think this is an important model, too. In 2015, um, the Obama administration uh, created an exception to the long-standing um, law that bans Pell Grants to be used in prisons um, under something called the Experimental Sites Initiatives Act. Uh, and what this did was it allowed 67 universities and colleges around the country to, um, to use Pell Grants to educate prisoners. We applied for and received one of, the exempt, one of these exemptions uh, at the University of Baltimore. And uh, it allowed us to create a degree granting program. So this is a model. It's a model worth pursuing. Um, right now, it is not open. But I'll bet that the University of Hawaii has other ways to offer credit inside of uh, Hawaii's prisons. Uh, so the last way, uh, and this is what I'm working on now, is to offer a degree granting program. Uh, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, um, either in partnership with a community college. I understand that you guys have a pretty good community college here that you have a good relationship with. Maybe that's a good, maybe something you should pursue. Or on your own. Um, there are other models uh, like the Inside Out program 
that's uh, sort of a branded program at Temple, where professors are able to take um, students from campus inside of prisons and jails to take courses alongside of, of incarcerated students. This can be enriching um, for both the incarcerated students and the campus students. Um, I think uh, my experience with this is mixed, uh, and I can say a lot more about how it works well and some problems with it um, in the Q&A. But what about? Here is the objections phase. So I think there are, th there are lots of objections I hear all, all the time, but uh, here, are, here are the three big ones I just want to run through. Do, do prisoners deserve a college education? Right. Aren't we trying to punish them? How can we make college education, especially you know, like the University of Hawaii at Hilo or, or Georgetown, like this, this is a hard to do, right? Hard to get in. How are we gonna offer this to these despicable humans that have already transgressed our norms? Right? That's the line. Um, it's, it's very common. Uh, and perhaps some of you have some version of this. You remember the transgression and you think, an education is something you deserve, it's something you earn, it's something that you have to fight for, and it's an honor. And prisoners shouldn't be honored, they should be dishonored. They deserve our contempt, not our respect. That's the argument. I've tried to argue uh, so far, that's a mistake. But some people um, will return to this objection time and time again. Um, and so everything I've been saying is designed to give you, the audience, the tools for thinking about this objection. Well, it makes us safer. Well, you know, in the United States, we are overly punitive. Well, uh, good punishment, the right kind of punishment, shouldn't act this way. But uh, I think there's a lot to be said for this objection still. Uh, and so I hope maybe we'll, we'll have this conversation in the Q&A. Are prisons dangerous? Are prisoners dangerous? Not in my experience. Um, you know, it's worth remembering that Brock Turner, the Stanford rapist, um, had no criminal record when he committed his crime. Um, in my experience, incarcerated students are bright, passionate, curious, respectful, and ultimately safe. Um, and I think that this is borne out by all the programs that I've seen operating in the United States, we're just not seeing that faculty and students who enter a facility to offer an education are unsafe thereby. However, prisons are not safe for prisoners. Um, they're very dangerous places. Uh, in 2003, the Bush administration passed something called the Prison Rape Elimination Act. It's an overly optimistic uh, law title, because what it really did was start to gather data on how often sexual assaults occur in prisons and jails. And the numbers are staggering. 214,000 sexual assaults in prisons and jails per year. Um, I have had students die, overdose, um, receive inadequate medical attention, and uh, ultimately die, um, and ultimately be killed in, in these facilities. I don't think that's a reason to turn our back on prisons, because as I've said, the college professors and college students who enter facilities to offer these experiences are very safe, they remain very safe, because the prisoners know what's at stake. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this might be a reason to think a little more seriously about the other uh, problem with the title of my talk, should we turn prisons into colleges? Well, maybe we shouldn't have prisons to turn into colleges, or at least as many prisons as we currently do. Um, so I'll just let me just acknowledge that up front. Prisons are dangerous for prisoners, and uh, we should be careful about reifying them. This is tied to my last, um, but what about my last objection? Uh, I just call this the Foucault objection. Uh, Michel Foucault wrote one of the most popularly cited books um, in the American Academy. It's called Discipline and Punish. And in this book, he, he made an interesting argument, a, a bit of an odd argument, but I, I want to share it with you very briefly. He argued that the history of prisons and of punishment in the United States and Europe has the following features. 
we start with very serious crimes being punished with grotesque and cruel corporal punishments. Um, but because the punishments were so spectacularly cruel, they were used very infrequently. Early prison reformers in the 18th and 19th centuries fought against the cruelty of punishment. Right? Um, the earliest prisons in the United States were created by Quakers. Uh, the Society of Friends, people who were going out of their way to try to reform punishment here to make it less cruel, less grotesque, um, to make it respect the prisoner. And every reform of this sort, every time we make prisons less cruel, less um, dehumanizing, seems to enable us, Foucault argues, to use them more. Right? The, the more gentle the punishment, the more broadly that punishment is disseminated. Right? Um, so that's the, uh, a sort of complicated objection, but the idea here would be prisons are terrible. And we can make them a little bit better by offering college courses inside of them. But prisons will still be terrible. If we make them a little bit better, will we incarcerate more people? I think that's an um, a, a anxiety that anyone who's interested in this question should continue to um, let eat at them. Because it's always possible that we'll make prisons a little bit better, we'll make probation and parole a little bit more sensible and we'll go from 2.3 million people in prison and seven people under carceral supervision to five and 10. Um, so that's the Foucault objection, and I gotta be honest with you, I don't have a good, I don't have a good response to that. Um, but it is, it is worth thinking about. An alternative to turning prisons into colleges is to eliminate them completely. I'll leave you with Angela Davis, who uh, in a book called Are Prisons Obsolete, um, argued that we need to work towards a society without prisons. Um, she did not argue that we should eliminate them entirely. She argued that we need to make it possible to live in a society where they could be eliminated. And she argued that prison education is one of the main keys to uh, achieving that goal. So if you are a prison abolitionist and you're here in the audience, um, then, it, and then Angela Davis at least thinks that you ought to be offering college education in prison. Um, a long quote, I'll just leave it up for now. So that's, that's what I wanted to tell you. Yes, we should offer uh, college education in prisons and jails, um, and there are a lot of good reasons for it. I hope you found one that will motivate you. I think I'll walk around with the microphone for anyone who sure. wants it. Questions? You know, I, I don't know how much you know about the Hawaii situation, and I don't, you know, I don't expect you to know about the Hawaii situation. But right now, the state is considering spending half a billion dollars to build an alternative to O Triple C, which is a jail. Yeah, that's a real big issue right now. So you build a prison, you're going to fill it, right? It's like you build a baseball stadium, you can, people can come. So that's the issue right now. So right now the biggest issue is to fight it and not allow that because so many people are dependent on the prison industry that they're selling it because of jobs, right? So, you know, this, it's, to me there's a kind of disconnect in what you're saying here. But even philosophically, even philosophically, you know, the, you mentioned Michelle Alexander's book, you know, The New Jim Crow, but you didn't really discuss that because that's, that's her whole argument, that the whole prison industry in America is the new slave system. And I think uh, uh, Eric Holder, the first black attorney general, uh, supports that because he was saying that the what you need to do is to get rid of the minimum uh, 
sentencing, which is three strikes you out. So that is philosophically, I think, a political decision that people like uh, uh, politicians use because they thought it would get them votes. And it, as a philosopher, I'm kind of surprised you didn't even talk about that. Because to me, that's a philosophical thing that wooed the population to move to mass incarceration in, in Bill Clinton era and, 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 and others. And so to me, you know, philosophically, I think you've got to deal with Michelle Alexander's thesis as a prison as a new Jim Crow and what Eric Holder is saying about what you need to do with that. So I think it's like, uh, it's like to me in Hawaii, you're doing a Kamehameha school stuff, you know, you know, dangle something for the elites, which is because not, not in Hawaii, I told you the Chief Justice, and I mean Supreme Court Justice um, Wilson is saying that the, edu the average educational level in Hawaii is fifth grade. In fifth grade, how many people are going to be able to attend this course? And then it's only the elites and those you affect with a 43% you know, recidivism, but for the mass people on the bottom, it's not even an option. So I have a lot to say. You, you said a couple of really important things, and I was hoping this would be the case. This is something I wanted to talk about in Q&A because it needs to be a little bit more interactive. Um, so two things. Michelle Alexander has played an extremely important role for raising awareness about mass incarceration and for its racialized effects. But Michelle Alexander is almost entirely wrong in her diagnosis. Um, she thinks, first of all, that federal policy, people like Bill Clinton, play a major role in, in the development of mass incarceration. Um, and you know, if you go through that book chapter by chapter, she's describing federal policies mostly um, that caused it. And then things like prosecutors lying as if that's doing most of the work. Um, and that's just not what caused mass incarceration. Mass incarceration is entirely the product of the states. Right? It wasn't Bill Clinton, at least as president. It might have been Bill Clinton as governor. Right? Um, and that's important because the federal government is, well, first of all, the president, Congress, and the Supreme Court are all controlled by Republicans. Right? So um, if you're looking at the federal government, you should be feeling pretty uh, helpless if you want to change this. Um, but if this is something that the state of Hawaii can address directly, and that you can, as Hawaiian citizens, work on, um, then that, that's helpful, right? That means that this is a more local issue and that there are things we can do here and now and not wait until 2020 in the next election. So that's the first thing. I think um, we have a, a lot of evidence that Alexander's diagnosis is wrong. Um, she doesn't have the right etiology, the right cause. Um, still a great title, still very important for raising awareness. So the second thing is that uh, we actually see that what did cause mass incarceration is something we call penal populism. People like prisons. They like punishment. Uh, there's a, a book that just won the Pulitzer Prize by James Foreman Jr. called um, Locking Up Our Own. And it's about how um, African American controlled cities have uh, adopted the same law and order uh, punitive measures that we see pushed in white-dominated spaces, even though the black elites are locking up black underclass. Um, and even though the African-American community experiences incarceration as something significant, like in the rest of the, the United States, experiences incarceration as something that's significantly more intimate, um, they're very likely to uh, you know, even black elites are likely to know people who have been incarcerated. The odds of a black male being incarcerated are one in three. Um, and if you, I, I have lots of black male friends who just live with that statistic all the time. Um, and yet, 
when you poll African Americans and you ask them, should prisons be harsher? Should sentences be longer? Or should we have fewer people in prison? 63% of them will say we should have more punishment. We should have more people in prison. Right? So this is the community that's affected most severely. And they too find it popular. Now, when that poll was reported, there was a contrast class, right? White people, 75% of them want more punishment. Oh, well, white people are to blame here, and I agree. But African Americans want it too. Um, and I think, I think it's important for Hawaiians to start having this conversation and ask what Hawaiians want. Um, so, so that's the second response I would want to give. The third one is this. This problem has taken 40 years to develop to the current state that it's in. And I wish that it would end tomorrow, but I, I just don't believe it will. So I think that we actually do need to adopt conscious strategies that are going to take 40 years to come to fruition for ending mass incarceration. Here's step one. Find formerly incarcerated individuals, educate them, let them be leaders who advocate for themselves and for their formerly incarcerated and currently incarcerated um, you know, uh, community. And one of the ways to do that is to find those elites and um, to educate them and certify them so that they can be the kinds of justice leaders that we need to take the next steps. Uh, because I've never been incarcerated, so when I advocate for this, my voice justly shouldn't count as much as I don't know, my friend uh, Dwayne Betts, who just got a Yale Law degree um, and is able to speak about what prisons are like in a way that I can only share with you, I can only put on a, a screen for you to see. So those would be my answers. I don't know, you feel free to respond if you're unsatisfied. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think what you're not saying about Michelle Alexander is racism, right? Sure. And, he, and, and even here in Hawaii, sure. this is an interim report on uh, HCR 85 task force uh, headed by the Chief Justice to write about prison, prison reform. They start off with talking about this proportion of the number of Hawaiians in prison, but the rest of the whole report is colorblind. So, what is your guess of the number of Native Hawaiians in prison in Hawaii? Radin Karasuda, PhD, says 60%. Uh, Kamanao Crab, head of OHA, says 40. Yeah, the population of Hawaiians maybe is 22. Right? But nobody's dealing with it, even in Hawaii. Oh, uh, if, if you felt that I did not properly represent that uh, mass incarceration is the problem. Yeah, no, the you're, using, you're using black people to argue about incarceration. You, you, I mean, you just read, uh, you know, black skin, white mask, and it makes sense why black people are, are for incarceration. It, it, that's not a reason against racism, all right? Right, no, no, no. I, so, I absolutely so, believe that racism drives I know, I, You know, to quote that the statistics of uh, surveying black people and saying that they believe in incarceration too, is not, you know, to me, is not, you know, is not conclusive. I see we gotta deal with racism seriously, and here in Hawaii too, especially in Hawaii because we don't want to accept that there's racism. I, I, I absolutely think that that's true. I agree. So first of all, I totally agree with um, having a college in prison. Um, you know, right now we don't, not here. Um, but at the same time, you know, I've heard different types of comments, like you started in the beginning. And, and for us, employment is, of course, the, you know, the pathway, the end of the, the goal to reach from education. So you can get a sustaining, gainful employment uh, with good education and not have to return to, uh, you know, reincarceration. 
getting involved with different types of lifestyles and different activities different friends i mean the whole world changes with education but one of the things that i get asked sometimes is aren't we just creating with true education smarter criminals you know that's kind of that's some of the things that i get asked sometimes and it's kind of hard to to answer that without any type of you know career pathway connected to it like you know well that's a smarter individual now but because they're going to get a better job so i i think for us um we we are um fortunately in a time where unemployment rates are like lowest ever and we you know here in hawaii island especially we've been able to um, garner support from employers uh, who are family friendly uh, we have laws that actually you cannot ask before um, it's conditional hire that you cannot go look at the records certain records um, for certain lengths of time can be excluded um, so you know we're very fortunate in that regard so so mostly everybody that are involved with the justice system ends up with employment so that's that's a great thing but then again they're ending up with employment without the educational piece and so they're in entry level they're getting jobs but then they're having a hard time to sustain families and and um, the cost of living you know just even for hawaii being one of the worst places in the nation for cost of living and housing it's, it's just very very difficult you can't even rent your own place so the, you know the, the question again back back to the original um, thing that i wanted to get to was are we just creating smarter criminals without a career pathway that, that's just Play devil's advocate. <laughs> I, I, it's a good, it's a good objection because I, I have heard some version of this several times. Um, no. <laughs> uh, but to to justify that claim, I, I need to say a bunch more. Uh, so. I think one of the things that we have to be careful about when we talk about college education generally is that while college educated um, workers have lower rates of unemployment, higher incomes over life, their lifetimes, better, they live longer, they have more marital satisfaction, their divorce rate is lower, college education is great. Right? Um, most of the benefits of a college education uh, have suffer from something that you might call, that we call the teleological paradox. If you get a college education, your goal in getting one is just to like get that certificate at the end, the sheepskin at the end, and you make it clear to everyone that you don't really value the education itself, you're unlikely to do well. Um, and you're not going to experience the kinds of transformations that college education is possible, uh, is capable of, that's possible for, for students. Um, and what we see in prisons is that purely vocational education, unlike the kinds of liberal arts, humanities, um, degree granting education, while it does reduce recidivism, reduces it at a much lower level. Um, it's a significant reduction, loss, right, from purely vocational efforts. So there need to be jobs. It sounds like there are because of low unemployment rates. But unemployment rates probably won't stay low forever. Right? Um, I think it's much more important to sort of embrace the identity of a college graduate, of a college student and then a college graduate over the long period of time and let um, that love of learning that I, I experience all the time inside of um, and outside of prisons, but, but definitely inside of prisons, let that be our guide. Um, because uh, the, the key here is, is that uh, we're not really, it's not that they're becoming smarter, right? I mean, they're actually pretty smart already. Um, and so they don't, we don't make smarter criminals, but we, we, we make smart people stop being criminals. And uh, that's really what's happening uh, in, in a prison education context. We change what kinds of things they think their future can hold. <coughs> um. 
I just wanted to say I, I really appreciated your idea of penal populism, and I'd love to read the book that you talked about, Locking Up Our Own. Um, I think the nuance in your approach to talking about that is bigger than one race or another or ethnic background um, without regard to any particular situation. Um, if the idea is that prisons are the solution, then we want prisons, right? Which would be the idea of courts responding, the legislatures responding, um, the idea that Ron talked about in terms of, you know, there's this push to build a half a million, half a billion dollar prison. Um, it seems like the larger norm that comes out of that is that prisons are good, right, and a solution, which I, I hear you refuting not only throughout your talk, but also in the idea that, um, <coughs> that if we rethink the norms, which actually was the second thing you talked about for the ritual, the apology ritual? Yeah. Right, which seems to speak to restorative justice frameworks, right, that like Ho'oponopono that look at healing, right? And so um, perhaps part of the healing for the non-incarcerated population would to rethink the norms of punishment that are produced and reproduced by prison. Absolutely. I think uh, uh, if I so, I just want to acknowledge that I'm I, uh, I'm not familiar with um, Hawaiian practices of restorative justice. I've been hearing about them; and they sound very exciting. Um, and there are practices like this in a lot of communities that we need to draw on, because it turns out that that whole story about reprobation and reintegration, and making the victim whole, and restoring the perpetrator to, you know, a, a, a member of our community again, that doesn't require prisons, right? And our biggest mistake has been assuming that we need to take away somebody's liberty and lock them up for a long period of time in order for that other stuff to happen. And usually, taking somebody away from their family, from their community, uh, locking them up, ignoring them and treating them for the rest of their lives like a second or third class citizen is not a good way of achieving that. Prisons are traumatic spaces. Um, and so what we really need to do is we need to um, find these alternatives. We need to maximize their use. We need, need to make that normal, right, and not prisons. Um, and I, I think that's like step two, but step one is prison education. <laughs> I don't necessarily have a question, but um, I'm from the college and we do run courses up at Kulani Men's Prison here, um, from an agricultural course, and they're all workforce readiness related. Um, we also have a re-entry program, and I will say that um, the one feedback we get from the men that take the courses, I have one of my instructors here as well, I coordinate all the courses, but I go up there all the time and talk to them, find out if the courses are working, do they like it. The biggest feedback I get from the guys is that um, they thank me because it's the first time in a long time they felt someone treat them like a normal person. And that's, that's big. And I was just talking to someone who was interviewing me today, a student down at the college, um, about the courses we do. And I was saying that um, I have seen men come into our class. Um, for a while we were suffering from low enrollment, so the warden said, all right, these new guys can't work yet, so they're going to take courses. And I walk in there, I always introduce myself, I talk to the class, because I want to, I'm, I'm trying to get buy-in from the men out there to take the courses. They're not mandatory. And you get guys sitting there like, oh, I'm in this class, and who the hell are you, white boy, howly. Um, but by the end, when I go back and check on the classes, and they've worked with Kaipo here on the ag farm that is going really well, huge difference in their attitudes, huge. I mean, they're open. They're talkative, they're appreciative. Um, all of my instructors up there reported that they are some of the best students they've ever had in any teaching situation ever, and you could probably attest to that. I think the biggest leap from here, and the question I'm always asking, is all right, if we could bring college back in to the prison system to help prepare them for coming back into our community, which only makes sense. They're coming back into our community. We should help them to do that and be successful. Is 
then getting the job. So they go to work furlough or they go to parole, and we can do the education there, but I'm seeing, I mean, right now, yes, our unemployment is low, so they're getting jobs, but as Les said, they're getting, you know, low-end jobs, and can they maintain a family? So how, I mean, I know there's no answer to it, but I keep asking myself, we seem to have a big missing link there. So if we did create a college level or brought it back in the, in the prisons where people can get degrees, it's then taking that next step and affording them that immediate work because then they're successful. And isn't, at the end of the day, that's what we want. Yes, they, they did their crime, they paid it. They paid their time, they paid their dues for it. So now if we're truly a, a benevolent society, then isn't our goal then to say, all right, you've done your crime, now let's bring you back in. Like you said, restoring them to, um, what was it? Status quo ex ante. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And that's about all I have. I may as well say something now then. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Um, you know, it kind of baffles me here in the conversations here because when you're on the ground, when you're in front of these incarcerated, you know, you get a different view of, of, of this, um, of this dilemma that they're dealing with. Yes, they get jobs that are not good, but when I'm in the class, I use every opportunity to bring in culture, bring in real practical experiences. We're teaching them and training them not just to be, um, get reintegrated into the workforce, but what I see is a, is a building of confidence, for one thing, to know that they can get through a college credited course. When they achieve this, they start thinking about things, not just getting into the workforce, but to going to school as a, as a, um, a pathway to, to ownership, uh, to entrepreneurship, to you know, bigger and better things. Agriculture is the center of a, a rural community, and when you yank that from the community, it trickles right down into the family. Um, this has inspired the students here. Problem I'm seeing is that they build the confidence, they learn a new trade, and I'm not, and, you know, they're not smarter, they're just redirecting their intelligence into something useful, something practical that they can, that they can use on the outside. But when they come out, now this is the problem I'm, I'm dealing with. Can we can we fund them in college? We've had more than um, more than a few that that are serious, and they've tried to go out and get into the college, get funded. But then we have a parole system that doesn't believe in education, even though it is a mandatory. And I've talked to the um, the the new department head for the parole that it's either education or workforce, but it's not supported in the real practical setting. So these are kind of, you know, all this that you're saying is really good. I think it's a great opportunity for not just educators, but uh, to learn to be better educators, but for the prisoners themselves when they're trying to reintegrate, pay their crimes, the support. Like you said, there's a cliff outside those gates. And, uh, you know, these are kind of the, this is why I'm here. I'm trying to see if there's a way we can build this bridge over this cliff when they step out of those gates. Um. So when we do, so we have a reentry program that we're developing, um, and in this reentry program, uh, we it's funded. The students have a mix of work and, and school, uh, and our goal for the returning citizens, we call them returning citizens in DC, to sort of draw a parallel with veterans returning from uh, the military. Um, when we, when we think about the needs that returning citizens have, um, it's work and prospects for more. And if you can get rid of the stigma, if you can educate yourself and pursue you know, a, a, a different life than the one that you're currently living, then you can make a big difference. Um, but Conditional, so parole throughout the nation has increasingly become not mandatory, but conditional. And it becomes, uh, as I was show, trying to show you earlier, it becomes this way of controlling um, formerly incarcerated workers' lives um, and disallowing them from escaping the stigma that they're, they're currently experiencing, right? Um, so unfortunately, that's, that's not something that I'm in a position to change, right? You neither. But that is something that citizens can advocate for. Um, that's something that must change. We need to restore, we need to either end or restore true parole in the United States. 
Um, and I think the more educated citizens, the more people who are working um, inside of prisons who understand these problems, the better able we will be as a community and as a, a nation to, to understand what we're doing wrong and do it better. Uh, what you just described is that parole in Hawaii requires people to pursue work and school doesn't count. Um, and there is some evidence what, that justifies this. It's all from the 70s. It says that uh, if people get out and they go directly to college, they basically are very likely to reoffend. Um, and all that is very low quality data um, that is drawn from a time when incarceration was massively exploding. Um, what we're seeing today is that education is just as good as work, and that both are really valuable because the work pays for your cost of living while you're getting your education. Um, but you just got to gotta convince the parole boards of that. And sometimes that means you've got to have some pretty, uh, some pretty difficult fights at the political level. Joshua, I really appreciated your talk. Um, I thought you made a really strong case that we should uh, have education in prisons, um, but you wouldn't have to convince me of that. I believe in education. I think it would be better for society as a whole. But I have this feeling that there was an implicit argument that you were uh, are behind your argument, an implicit assumption, which I wanted to maybe perhaps draw out, and that is that, um, that, the, that the prison problem uh, cannot be addressed without addressing the larger problem of society. And that, and that um, for example, well, one, I have two questions regarding the, that. Is one, how much does the mass incarceration, how much of that is the product of the fact that it has become profitable, that prisons are profitable, and that, it's, that people are making a lot of money on that? And the second question goes to your Angela Davis quote. Can you go back to that person? Sure. Always uh, happy to read more Angela Davis. Yeah, so my guess is your answer to that is abolition. And that implies the broader issue I'm trying to get at. Are, are, are you making a claim that we do have a larger problem to deal with in, in, uh, in reforming society as a whole? It, it's not a prison problem. It's a, it's a bigger problem. How can, we, how can we abolish prisons without? Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you how I think about this. Um, and that's that I think that we often get hung up on the idea that perpetrators need punishment. They need to be held to account. They need to be held responsible. Um, and I, I, I think that's unavoidable. But prisons aren't the only way to do it. And we've become obsessed with that particular method. So sometimes I think that the way to solve society's larger problems is to start in the prison system, start with this system. Because um, you always have a chicken and egg issue, right? Well, how are we going to solve the bigger problems in society? You know, uh, Angela Davis will talk about racism and, and capitalism as the, the big problems that we need to abolish. Um, and my claim would be, well, you know, I don't know how to fix the big stuff, but I see that if we could just fix parole, things would be a little bit better. If we could just incarcerate I don't know, 20% fewer, things would be a little bit better. And I, I really want to see us start, I'm, I, this is just how I'm built, I want to see us get some snowball, right? Let's get some small wins under our belt. Because it's been nothing but losses on this front for 40 years, right? So something great happened last year. We now incarcerate 100,000 fewer people than we did last year, right? Than we have for several years now. And, and that's a win. It's not much of a win, but it's a win. If we can do that again next year, and the year after that, and the year after that, and change our policies, uh, and su sort of support that, then I think we will be better off. Um, but yeah, my, my way of thinking about this is that there's a prison problem, there's a social problem. I don't know how to get the social problems. Even the prison problems are really, really hard. But those I can intervene at. I would say the social problem, the larger social problem, I think that is indicated is the is the is the whole problem of economic justice and equity. And right. So, and so this is how is can, is profit the yeah, problem? Yeah. The profit motive. Yeah. Uh, it's really important to understand that if, if uh, you read some of the popular stuff on this, a lot there's a lot of emphasis on private prisons. Private prisons are not very common. Right? It's about seven percent of prisoners. Six percent. Um, 
But there's still a profit problem. The United States, in Maryland, for instance, the largest single public employer is the correction system, right? Uh, in California, right, the unionized uh, corrections officers lobby for stricter laws. Um, and so there can be a profit motive without corporations, without um, uh, for-profit institutions. Um, and you know, even when prisoners work for state-owned enterprises, which they often do instead of, uh, I mean, they also make things like Victoria's Secret you know, underwear and things like that. But um, sometimes they're just making uniforms for police officers and uh, you know, desks for the university which is actually, you know, the state-owned universities, which is pretty common in Maryland. Uh, even in those cases, the industriousness of prisoners is something that uh, encourages us to incarcerate more people, and we, should, we need to stop that. We need to remove those incentives wherever we find them. Um, Am I right in guessing that your answer to that question would be abolitionist? I call myself a six-sevenths abolitionist. I think we need to abolish roughly six-sevenths of uh, prisons. But then there's some people who probably shouldn't be in prison. I know some of them. They're good people, but they did really bad stuff. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for coming. The, especially the students who have to prepare for finals, the, uh, your chance for making out here, all the professors also preparing for finals, and our allies at HCC, so thanks so much for coming out, and uh, people from the community who are working hard on this. Uh, um, we should be working together, and uh, please keep in touch. So the philosophy department is small. If, you, uh, if, uh, if there's anything you think we can help you with, contact any of the three of us. Uh, our website is easy to find, and we have our pictures on there anyway. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thanks so much for your job. Thank you.